number five. We talked about last time the place, the evil tidings. We talked about uh, all of the enemies there in the land. We talked about a replacement. We talked about repercussions in verse three, reaction in verse four. Now let's look at review in verse number five. Exodus chapter 33 and verse number five. For the Lord had said unto Moses, say unto the children of Israel, ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore put off now thine ornaments from thee that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by the Mount Horeb. Does anybody know what Mount Horeb is? Mm, you got to turn y'all into some Bible scholars here. It's the same as the Mount Sinai, okay? Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai are the same uh, place. It's the same mountain. Now, the thing we got to understand in verse 5 is, thank God the Lord was watching. We gotta understand some God's eyes are going to and fro around the earth all the time looking for those whose heart are diligent to him. Those who are seeking to please him. Those who love him. Those who are serving him. Second Chronicles 16, nine says, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong, not to just see what you're doing, but so that when he finds you serving him, he can strengthen you. That ought to make you shout hallelujah. That as long as you're serving God and he's watching, he's going to strengthen you. I was working on my message. I knew I was going to say something bad. I just can't get it out of my brain. But I'm working on my messages for Christmas. And I'm going to preach a message, the four fear knots of Christmas. And it was talking about Ananias, Ananias that's wrong, Zacharias and Elizabeth. And uh, how that they had a perfect testimony. Had a perfect testimony. They were blameless before the Lord. And that God was about to announce to them the birth of their son, John the Baptist, in their old age. Now, they didn't have any children. She was barren. And because of their faithfulness, because of their blameless state, God looked down and said, I'll pick that couple to bring John the Baptist into the world because his eyes are always looking to be strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect. That word perfect means not perfect in the sense of sinless, it means perfect in the sense of complete toward him. In other words, you're focused on him. You're not doing it for yourself. You're not doing it to get what you can get out of it, but you're doing it because you love the Lord and because you care about him. He wanted to see if Israel here really loved him. Did they really trust him? Did they really want him to be with them as they go into the promised land? So this was a test. Sometimes I believe I live at 666 Test USA. Any of y'all feel like that at times? But God does test us. That's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And God will test his people. Look at 1 Peter 1, 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though for now for a season. In other words, you don't rejoice all the time. I wished I could. I wished I felt as good all the time as I feel right now. But you don't. Because life's full of ups and downs, ins and outs and valleys. And uh, trials and tribulations and tests. You are in heaviness through manifold or many different styles and types of temptations. Tests and trials. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Christ. When a jeweler goes to buy jewel, uh, gold, he wants to buy the cleanest, purest gold he can find, or the cleanest, purest silver he can find. He doesn't want something with impurities in it because you know what will happen? It will make the, the gold of less value. It won't be as, as worth as much with uh, dross and different uh, trashes still in it. So they take that gold and they put it in a fire and they burn it and they stir it and then they pour it into molds 
And so they get all the dross out. It comes to the top and they skim it off. And they keep skimming until there is no more. And then they pour that pure gold. Or that, what is it? What's the highest gold? 18 carat? Is that the highest you can get? Speak up. 24 karat gold, okay. See, I ain't never bought none of that, so you know I don't know that. But anyway, 24 karat gold, when they get it as the purest form, that's when they'll put it and use it for their jewelry and sell it and use it for merchandise. And then it says in verse number eight, whom having not seen, ye love. We've never seen God. I had a little old lady one night, she stood up and said, I seen God last night. And I said, wait a minute, oh, ho, oh, right there. And I opened up that verse in the Bible, says no man has seen God at any time. And uh, she got mad and left. <laughs> she got mad, stomped out and slammed it over and she left. I won't let anybody stand there and lie. The Bible says no man has seen God at any time. That's what the Bible says. That's the truth. Say amen. I won't let her sit down and come up with some concocted story because she had too much pizza and buttermilk before she laid down. You lie to dream, dream anything if you have too much pizza and buttermilk before you go to bed. And so... Uh, no man's seen God at any time, so we've never seen, but we love him. He's just as real to me as you are. He talks to me, not verbally. I ain't got no mental problem. I don't have a mental problem. He don't speak, speak to me verbally. I've, I've never heard his voice verbally, but I've heard his spirit through the word of God speak to me and tell me where I need to go and what I need to do. And you will too. God will speak to you. You don't see him, but you can feel him through the word of God. Hear him through the word of God. <clears throat> it says, believing, that's faith. Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'll tell you, I, I took a risk Sunday morning because God spoke to me. I don't, Ken Vipperman sitting back there. Ken, how many times in 20 years have I changed my message on a whim? Maybe twice in 20 years. I just don't do it. Why? Because I get in trouble when I do that. Say amen or oh me. I, I got to have notes in front of me so I can know where I'm headed and know what I got to say. I hadn't done it in, twice in 20 years. But the Lord kept telling me, the more he sang about the blood, the more he said, you, you're not preaching that message this morning. You're going to preach on the blood. I said, Lord, but I'm scared. I don't have no notes. He said, oh, you don't need no notes. Just open your Bible, open your mouth, and I'll fill it. Now, that's scary. That's scary. I had a preacher call me this afternoon. Hey, how you doing? I said, doing fine. Next thing I know, he's giving me a date for a meeting. And I thought, my land. And he said, uh-oh, who is this? I said, this is Brother Walter. He said, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. He said, I thought I was calling somebody else. I said, well, that's real nice. He calls, set up a meeting with me, and you think you're talking to somebody else. You know, just crazy things like that. But God will never treat you that way. Amen? God will never treat you that way. Hey, he knows who you are, where you are, what you're doing. And listen, he'll give you joy unspeakable and full of glory and receiving the end of your faith, trusting him with what? The salvation, look at that word, souls, plural. You know why God changed my message Sunday morning? There's somebody here need that message and they get saved and they got saved. God did that, Walter didn't do it. Because I wanted to preach that message I preached Sunday night. I done worked hard on that thing. I was ready to preach that thing Sunday morning. No, God said no. Why? Because he knew that he had a job to do. And folks, that, look, you can't be any happier than when God reaches through you and touches somebody else's life. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. Now, here we see that God even told them that removing their jewelry, their trinkets and mourning was the right path to take. We clearly see here the gracious and sweet leading of God and his desire to be with his people. God wants to meet with us tonight, rain or no rain, sunshine or no sunshine. He wants to come in this room tonight and speak to every one of us and help us leave here knowing him better than we can, loving him more than we can. And folks, that's the reason we meet to worship him, is to get closer to him so he can be real to us. Because ain't none of us in here perfect. There's none of us in here going to leave here tonight and got a perfect path ahead of us. Why? Because we're human beings. But if we leave here hand in hand with him, there's more of a chance he might jerk you back in line than if you ain't with him. Amen? I want to be hand in hand with the Lord. I want to know that he's leading me all the way. I want to know I'm not in some ditch or some pothole 
because I didn't follow closely with him. Mount Horeb, again, is another name. Showed the pictures there, uh, Brother Kim. Or Mount Sinai, which is in the Sinai Peninsula. It's between Egypt and Israel. Israel is up in the, um, let me see if I say this correctly, the northeastern part. Did I say that right? Of the map there. And then it's right in the middle is Mount Horeb. And then there's a picture. You got them both together or separate? Okay. Well, we'll look at the map first. So you see Egypt on the left and Israel on the right. Let me tell you why this is important. Mount Sinai is right in between the old life and the new life. Did you notice that? So this is decision time. They're making decisions while they're in this Sinai Peninsula. And of course we know they don't always make good decisions. But this one was a good decision. They made a good one here. Now show them Mount Horeb. Uh, that's Mount Horeb right there. Now I want you all to notice that cleft in the eastern side. Do you see that little shadow there? That's where Moses was when God passed by. You need to know that in a few minutes when I preach on it. I don't think it'll be this week, but when we get to it. You need to remember, that's the cleft. You know, cleft of the rock. He said, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock so I can pass by you. And so you can get down in that little hole right there, and you can't see nothing. And that's where Moses was. But when the Lord passed by Mount Sinai, hey, he, he lit up the whole place. And that's how he saw his glory. So that's why I want you to understand and see that picture. Because until you see it, you don't understand it, do you? You think he's in some cave. You say, well, how can he see? You can see through out the door of the cave. But you get in the cleft of a rock, you can't see anything. You're down in that cleft. And so that's where the Lord put him. But anyway, so let's look at verse 7, examination from their tents. Let me put this to you another way. Examine them where they live. <laughs> examine them where they live. And tonight, you know what the Lord's going to do with his word? He's going to examine you right where you are. And he's going to look at your heart. And he's going to speak to you. Verse 7a, worship. And Moses took the tabernacle, the place of worship, and pitched it without the camp. Uh-oh, he moved it. He took it outside the camp. He was doing that for a reason. Afar off from the camp. And called it the tabernacle of the congregation. Now Moses was leading the way a good leader would lead. He set up the tabernacle leading the people to the place of worship and reaching out to the Father in heaven. He took them out of their comfort zones so God could speak to them. He didn't did it without the camp because he heard what the Lord had said and he honored what the Lord's wishes were about being a distance from his people because of what happened at the calf. Moses was a very smart man. He believed God at his word. And he said, man, I don't want to lose my nation. I don't want to lose my people. So I'm going to put the tabernacle a distance off because I don't want God to, to make them disintegrate before my eyes. He's trying to protect his people. I want to tell you something. Whether it's a father, a mother, a pastor, a teacher, an employer, or a government leader, or any person in a position of responsibility over people, that is a privilege. That is a privilege. And we better make sure we're listening to God because of the people who are following us, the people who are watching us. Every Wednesday night, those kids get off that van and they'll start and come running through here and they always want to come speak to the preacher. And one of them always grabs a stack of them bulletin, a prayer, prayer list and comes and preacher, you need one? I said, I'm sorry, son, I already got one, but I thank you for trying to get me one. They just want, they want to know who I am. They know I'm the pastor. And folks, I got to watch what I do because of them. I got to watch what I do because of you. Why? Because I'm a leader. A leader has to set an example. In your home, you better be the leader. Listen, don't you tell those kids, do as I say, not as I do. That don't work. Okay? It doesn't work. You have to say, do as I say, and follow as I do. Because listen, you can't live one way and then tell your kids to live another way. It is not going to work. You have to be a leader. You have to be an example. And you have to be a go-between sometimes between them and God. Now, Moses calling it the tabernacle of the congregation, he was enticing the people to worship God and praise his name and pray to him. He's trying to bring God and the nation of Israel back together. 
I was listening to that CD coming to church on God Bless America Again. And you know, that what that song's trying to do is bring the nation and God back together again. I'm reading a book now, and I, I wanna, when I get done reading it, I'll suggest it to you. It's just a little teeny book, but it's a, a great book by an Australian fellow. He's a creation uh, man who does a lot. He's a guy who's built this ark out in Kentucky. I mean, y'all heard about the ark in Kentucky. Uh, he's building that. And I'm reading his book right now. Uh, Wendy's in there running on the treadmill and I'm reading a book. I sit in the car and read a book while she, I'm exercising this while she exercises her body. And so I've been reading this book and it's talking about the difference in society today because I've asked myself this question here lately. Why could 35, 40 years ago why could a preacher set up a tent and crowds would just come? People would just get saved. Now you can't pull people in a church. You can't beg them and bribe them to get them in a church. I've never seen a time in my life where people have just turned their back on God and the Word of God. But in this book, he answers that question for me. And the answer is simply this. 30 years ago, we were took to church and taught in church the Word of God. And we believed the Word of God. We were read the Word of God in school. We prayed in school. And 30 years ago, hey, we knew we had a foundation to build on. We, we had a simple understanding until somebody come and gave us the gospel and we got saved. You don't have, their kids don't have that foundation anymore. All they know is how to... The biggest muscle in most kids' bodies is their thumbs. And I'm not talking about Fonzie either. Huh? See, some of y'all so old, y'all don't even know who Fonzie is. But anyway, hey. Y'all a dead crowd. I'm trying to make y'all laugh. It's getting harder. But the society today has gotten so lazy, so selfish. They don't go to church. They don't take their kids to church. The kids are not getting, and it's not the school's job. I'm sorry. It's not the school's job to teach your children the word of God. Thank God they did, but they don't do it anymore. It's our job at home and get them in church. I'm going to tell you something. I thank God my mom and daddy didn't send me to church. They did first because they were lost. But after my mom and daddy got saved, they took me. I never rode the bus again after my mom and daddy got saved. I didn't have to. Mom and daddy was going to church then. I rode with them to church. I didn't have to ride the bus no more. And that opened up some seats on the bus for somebody else to come. Say amen. Matter of fact, my daddy got to drive in one of the buses and my mama drove us to church. But they took me to church. They didn't send me. But that's not happening today. It's not happening. And, and the average person today between the age of, of 7 and 37, they got no idea what the lingo of the Bible is even about. They don't even know what the Bible's about. You ask them who Jesus is, they say it's a Mexican who lives down the road. I'm serious. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know what a Bible is. They have no basic understanding of the Word of God. And, and that's why we can't win them to God anymore. We've kicked God out of the house. We've kicked Him out of the school. We've asked Him to leave and He leaves. He's not going to stay where He's not wanted. What I'm trying to say is our job is much harder now than it's been. I've been praying. My particular tell you, I talked to him Sunday. I've been praying about how are we going to get this revival off the ground. Well, I prayed about it, and I think the Lord gave me a good idea. We're going to do it. Sunday morning, you get your bulletin. There's going to be a white sheet of paper in that bulletin. And inside that bulletin is going to be a place for 10 names and addresses. And you're going to have homework Sunday. So get ready. Sharpen your pencil. You're going to have homework. I want you to go home. I want you to pray. I want you to pray like you've never prayed before. God showed me 10 people who are backslidden or don't know the Lord. And you give the church their name and we're not going to go visit them. We're not going to bug them. All we're going to do is this. We're going to take their name and their address and we're going to send them an invitation from you. It's going to be personalized. Have their name on it. Have your name on it. And we're going to mail it to them. Then we're going to give you your sheets back. So make sure you put your name on it. It's a place there for your name. Then we're going to give them back to you. Then or two weeks before the revival, you call them and say, did you get my invitation? 
want you to come to revival with me. And remind them. And then the next week, remind them again. And all along, you're praying for that list of the people that you chose. I've already got mine. I got 20 names already. I ain't got started good. But I'm going to get, and we're going to sit here one day. Poor office workers, they'll have a headache that day. But we're going to mail out all those letters. And we're going to send them. We're going to invite them to come. Send them a flyer. Send them a letter. Then you're going to call them. And you're going to pray for them. You're going to call them again. And look, folks, revival is not just for you to come sit in this pew and get blessed. Revival is to start praying now, God, help me get my lost friends saved. Help me get my backslidden friends back in church as Tony prayed tonight. He said, pray for some folks who knew he's got a church. Folks, we got to learn to pray. We got to learn to work. Our, we got to be concerned about the relationship of others with God. That's what we're here for. Now, Psalms 22, 3. It says, but thou art holy, and thou inhabitest the what? The praises of Israel. Now, folks, I, I'm, not, I'm not whistling Dixie. I'm trying to teach you something. I'm not trying to spit on you. I'm trying to teach you something. When you praise God in the face of other people, God inhabits that. Do you understand that? He's already inhabiting you, right? You're saved. He lives in your heart and soul. But if you go out and you witness to somebody who's lost, he's in you and he accentuates your praise. Some of you say, well, I'm scared to death. Don't be afraid. Open your mouth and he'll fill it. That's what the Bible says. Believe him at his word. Well, I don't know enough about the Bible. You don't have to know anything about the Bible to invite somebody to church. Just invite them to church. Tell them what God done for you and say, I'd like him to do it for you. Come on, church with me. And folks, you guys, look, it's a sorry fisherman who'll sit in a boat, put one worm on the hook, throw it out there for five minutes and get mad and go home. If you're a real fisherman, you'll use every worm you've got and you'll sit there all day long until you burn, slam up, trying to what? Catch that fish. And Christians won't even, well, I'm scared to ask them again. I might run them off. Where are you going to run them? To the second and third hell? They're lost. Where are you going to run them? I'm so sick of that excuse I could just, just, just throw a bit. Well, you can, I, listen, it's all in how you approach them. Now, if you get up in their face and you tell them, you're a lost sinner and you're going straight to hell. You mean as a devil. No wonder they don't listen to you. That's not how you witness to somebody. You witness to somebody, you share the gospel with them. The death, the burial, the resurrection. They'll get the conviction on their own. Amen? You don't have to be mean to them or, or vicious with them. Just share the gospel. Just invite them. Show them a little what? Love and what? Concern and affection. Show them that you care. He inhabits the praise of Israel. He inhabits the praise of the church now. Let's get out here and tell people we got a good God, amen? A powerful God. Inhabitus is the Hebrew word yashab. Yashab. It means to sit down, specifically as a judge, to dwell, to remain, causatively to settle, to marry. You realize when you got saved, you married God. You married Christ. You're the, we're the bride of Christ, the church. To abide, to continue, to dwell, uh, uh, ease self, endure, establish, habitation, inhabitant, uh, to make, to keep, uh, to keep house. That means he ain't going nowhere. He's going to set up to stay. I'm sorry. These people that believe you can lose your salvation, you are messed up. God didn't move in to move out. His blood's powerful enough to save you forever. Say amen or oh me. Hey, inhabitus, uh, to make, to keep house, to bring again to place, to remain, to return, seat, settle down, sit down, and tarry. So in other words, if you start praising God, he's going to come out in you. Say amen or amen. He's going to come out in you. And that is exactly what God wants you to do. He wants to get you so full of him tonight that when you leave here, you're going to spill out to other people. That's the whole thing. And Psalms 148, 13, let them what? Praise the name of the Lord. For his name is alone is the excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. 
Now look, if you're going to go out and talk about yourself, ain't nobody ever going to get saved. But you go out and talk about Jesus and people are going to get saved. Lives are going to be changed. He also exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Praise ye who? So that's our job tonight is to leave here and praise the Lord. Look at verse 7b, without. And it came to pass that everyone which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was what? They left their house and they went to church. They weren't afraid of dying. They wanted to be where God was. When I was a kid, if I, you may laugh at this, but laugh you won't come, it's time to try. When I was a kid, if my mama looked at me and said, we won't go into church, I'd sit down on the floor and cry like a baby. I would. I'd sit on the floor and cry. And my mama would get on the phone and find somebody going to church to come get me and take me. Because I didn't want to be, I love going to church. I love going to Sunday school. I love going to children's church back then. I didn't go to preaching. I went to children's church. Then on Sunday night, I love going back to church. That was evangelistic night. That's when you brought visitors and saw people saved back in the 70s. Everybody went out on Sunday morning, brought a friend back Sunday night to evangelistic service on Sunday night. And boy, they'd sing and preach a, a, a soul winning message and people get saved. We just have a snot slinging, crying good time on Sunday night. Then on Wednesday nights, we had a Awanas. They had an old tent they put up in the back and that's where we had a Awanas. They had a jet engine. I'm not lying to heat that tent. Put the jet engine inside the tent, crank that thing up to heat that tent so we could run around and play games for Awanas. I mean, they did everything they could do to get kids in. Boy, they had them everywhere. I think we had about 250, 300 kids every Wednesday night for Awanas because those leaders loved those kids and wanted to see those kids grow up to be what I am today. I won't tell you I wouldn't be a preacher today if it wasn't for Awanas. Awanas, I learned scripture. I memorized scripture and I learned how to lead people to the Lord. And that's what made me the preacher I am today. Folks, I love to go into church. When I got to old enough to drive, I'd say, Mama, can I have a car and go to church? Yeah, go on, get out of here. I'd go to church. She didn't have to worry about where I was. She knew where I was at. I was at church. When, uh, uh, when I got in, in my uh, older years, when I was in, in college, I went to college all day, but if it come church time, I still won't go to church. Every week when the schedule come out at McDonald's, if I saw I had to work on Sunday, I went to throw in a fit. And I'd always find somebody who'd switch places with me so I'd work whatever day they wanted me to work as long as I got off on Sunday because I wanted to do what? I want to go to church. And I still today, I like to go to church. I, like, I get here early. I'm not the first one here because big boys, he's the first one here. He's got to be the first one. And he's here and unlocking the door. But I'm about the second or third one to get in the door. I want to go to church. Say amen. And these people want to be close. Why? Because the Lord's here. I want to be where the Lord's people are and where the Lord's work is. And uh, they, there were those who had been faithful and those who had, been, had repented of what they did wrong at the calf who were ready to get on with serving and following the Lord. And they left their homes and they went to worship and praised the Lord's holy name. This kind of worship kills those who say you stay home and worship the Lord. No, you cannot. The church is a called out what? assembly. You can't change the definition. That's what the Bible says it is. We come tonight to gather together and we leave our homes and we assemble together to worship the Lord. Now here's the tickle point number C. Here's the one y'all looking for. Exodus 33a. And it came to what? When Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his what? Tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. You know why they did that? They said if Moses gets in, he can get in. <laughs> Amen? Hey, their, their, their hearts were shown by their obedient actions. They didn't sit in the room and chew on a chicken leg and turn a TV on, drink a Pepsi Cola. They was looking out the tent door waiting for Moses to go to the tabernacle because said, Moses is going, it's time for us to go. 
It's time for us to gather. It's time for us to worship the Lord. They were alert and awaiting in their place at the door of their tent, ready to be led and directed by Moses, the man of God. And they were ready to follow him to the tabernacle. And they were not only ready to follow him to the tabernacle, you know what that meant? They were ready to follow him to the promised land. Thank God for that. Amen. They knew the first step to finding the pathway of God was they had to worship him. See, you've got to live tomorrow. But I hope you come to church tonight to hear the word of God. So just in case you've got a problem tomorrow, you'll know what to do. Amen. That's what you come to church for. Because tomorrow's coming. Tomorrow's coming. And we want to do what the Lord wants us to do tomorrow. And the more we worship him, the more he'll love us. And he'll bless us. And he'll rise up in us. And he'll take control. Because that's what we want. is him to be in control. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed.